Hi there. So welcome to Reykjavik Iceland again. We're going to have a chat about Snorri Sturluson, um, the writer of the poetic Eddas, um, Heimskringla and uh, probably Eil Saga. We'll talk about that later on. But uh, with me is Sigrun. Uh, uh, what, what's the, are, are you the caretaker, division manager? What's the official title? Yeah, yeah the official title is uh, uh, department manager in Snorostova. Okay. So okay. I'm responsible for the guest reception, everything that has to do with the tourists, uh, and uh, also apartments for scholars and conferences and things like that here on the site. Okay, okay. So, uh, so just... Uh, Go if we go straight to the basics of of this. What who is Snorri Sturluson and why is he so in, influential? Why? Well, you you've been giving him a, pro a proper uh, introduction. <laughs> yes, introduction. Um, I'm, I'm not used to speaking English anymore. It's been such a long time with tourists. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, we are. Uh, yeah. We are all rusty. We are all rusty. No, we're don't, a little don't, bit rusty. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll, we'll, this, is, this is very relaxed, so... Yeah, no problem. Uh, well, Snorri Stuttleson is born in 1179, and uh, uh, he lived in Reykholt from 1206, uh, most of his adult life, and he is uh, actually murdered here, or basically executed by his enemies in 1241. Uh, he's a very important man because of his work. He was a writer, a historian, and a scholar. Uh, and he did most of his work here in Reykholt. And as you told, uh, well, told in your introduction, he wrote uh, the Edda, which is the story of the Nordic gods, uh, the Nordic mythology, uh, and Heimskringla, which is the biography of the Norse kings, and basically the, the kings of Scandinavia, and the first of the Icelandic sagas, which is Eil Saga, uh, Skallgrimsson. Uh, and yeah, uh, it, it's basically the first of the Icelandic sagas. It's, it's nearly 100% certain that he, he he wrote that. And so, um, so you're so yeah. you're so so sure. It's always uh, the yeah. when you when you're studying One these things. Five percent or so, yeah. But uh, so you're so you're 100. percent You're not. 98. I'm 100. percent Yes, of course, of course. He's my great grandfather in the 80, 28th generation. So of course, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that Eyjel. Uh, yeah, he, and he was, of course, a real person, and that's not a, was also as my great grandfather in the twenty third generation that he wrote his, the story of his of his life. Of course, and he's probably your great grandfather as well in the twenty second or twenty third yeah, generation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was not going to mention that, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, uh, yeah, it's not a, it's not a, it's, um, yeah, he was a he was a ladies' man, right? Yes, well, well if you were. Uh, 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 man, a uh, well, wealthy man at that time. Of course, there was, was, was never a problem with uh, with ladies, and he actually had uh, uh, five five children with three different women, uh, two with his wife and uh, and the rest of them with his mistresses. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he, he, was, he was only he was only married twice, but uh, but had mistresses, of course. Mm -hmm. It's also just natural for that time. Yeah, of course, of course. I just um, so uh, <laughs> if you could afford was, them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, so he was also uh, the law speaker. What's uh, yes. we, we we talk about that a little bit. He was the uh, he was the elected law speaker at at the parliament of I Iceland. We yes. we we pride ourselves of being having the longest parliament in the world from nine hundred and thirty. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes debatable because we were a Danish colony, but that's another story. But uh, that's but much later. Yeah. <laughs> As much later. Yeah. Okay. So he was elected uh, law speaker. So that's like uh, the what, what? What would be the description? Right description of the president, or, or no, not the president. The no, not really. it will be some, somewhere between a president and a judge. Yeah, yeah. He's the he's the yeah. leader of uh, of the house of the of the. Yeah, yeah, sort of. You, you, you would be, of course, a, a very well educated person and, and a wise man, and a man mm -hmm. that would be able to, uh, you know, to, to know the law and uh, also to uh, solve disputes between different families. There were, of course, arguments and disputes uh, all the time, and uh, the law speaker had, of course, to solve that. And mm -hmm. he would also be the judge uh, if you were convicting a person. And he would be mm -hmm. the one to decide which penalty uh, uh, the person would have to pay. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, there were there were no executions in Iceland, 
but you would normally have to pay a penalty. And for a wealthy person who had done something uh, serious, it could be a great deal of money. It could be uh, everything he owned nearly, you know, a whole farm or, or maybe several farms. Mm-hmm. So there could be a, a big penalty. Or exile. You, you, you could also be exiled from Iceland if, uh, if yes, there were harsh course. penalties. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, and that would be uh, normally between three or 20 years. Um, but uh, uh, not not very often the 20 years. But of course, one of the most famous person who got 20 years was uh, uh, was uh, Grettir, Ásmundarson, yeah. Grettir the Strong, which is in, yeah. in one of the Icelandic sagas. So he got 20 years and he was executed by his enemies or murdered by his enemies on the on the 20th year after mm. a little bit more than 19 years, which was very sad for him, of course. Yeah, he was uh, uh, so. And the Grettir saga is one of the Icelandic sagas. So uh, it's a it's a fun story. It involves ghosts and and all kinds of uh, yeah. He Grettir the Strong. He was he was obviously haunted by all kinds of creatures. But uh, yeah, he was he was kind of like an outlaw in Iceland. He was living on the off the land, and and he was. As he was exiled, he was, uh, you know, a- anybody could kill him without p- impunity. So, so they could, um, and as you said, he was killed on his on the twentieth day of his <laughs> exile. <laughs> so, unfortunately, but that's a, there, there's a, quite a story to that. Uh, but we're not going to get into that how how he was killed and uh, oh, the witchcraft. Yeah. The, the witchcraft saga themselves. And yeah, yeah, the witchcraft yeah. involved that. But uh, yeah. it's another story. So. Uh, Okay, so uh, he was chieftain and um, kind of like one of the most important persons in Iceland uh, at that period. Period. He uh, he also uh, he befriended some Norwegian kings, right? Yes. Well, it's always nice if you want to be uh, uh, influential in your own country to be a f- have kings uh, in a foreign country as a friend. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's, of course, what he wanted. He wanted to be acquainted with the Norwegian kings to increase his powers uh, domestically in Iceland. Mm -hmm. So uh, he travels uh, to Norway in 1218. And uh, the purpose, like I said, is to to increase his influence uh, by this friendship. And uh, at that time, there are two kings in Norway. There's uh, uh, the young king, Håkon Håkonsson, the Birkebeina king, which, of course, Mm -hmm. is a very famous person. Uh, He's just 13 years old at that time. And because of his young age, uh, his uh, uncle is uh, ruling with him. This is uh, Skule Bardason, uh, the uh, the Earl of Norway. He's around 30 years old at that time. And uh, and uh, um, well, Snorri stays with uh, the Earl and the King for two years, and uh, he develops a very close friendship with uh, with the Earl. And uh, this is actually a friendship that will last while they both live. But uh, what happens is that uh, the kings, they discuss with Snorri that they want him to uh, help them to get Iceland under their kingdom. They felt that it was just natural that Iceland uh, belonged to them. And he promises to do that. But when he returns to Iceland, he doesn't really do anything about it. He simply, um, well, you might say he forgets it. Yeah, yeah, he, he forgets it. He, he appreciates their gifts and says something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're yeah. you're gonna take over Iceland, but then kind of yeah, lets it drift and stays on being the important, most important person in in yeah, Iceland. Yeah, because the idea was not very popular in Iceland anyway, so he just decided to let the matter lay. And uh, of course, he yeah, he got some very nice presents. He sails uh, back home to Iceland with in uh, a ship that is a present from his good friend, mm-hmm. uh, the, the Earl, and uh, the the ship is loaded with nice presents. Uh, fine European wine and uh, weapons and and expensive clothing. Mm -hmm. So he's quite content with himself when he returns home to Iceland. But that plays a part in his downfall, right? You know, with that, that he didn't do anything at the time. And uh, also his friendship with the Earl, that uh, that was not not a very popular thing for for the young king when he grew grew up a couple of years. No, you shouldn't mess with kings. So <laughs> if you don't do what they what they wish, uh, you can get into deep pro- uh, problems. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe what he uh, um, th- thought at that time was that this uh, whole matter with Iceland coming under the kingdom of Norway would be forgotten, that uh, the kings, they would simply get other interests and uh, turn the noses to some other, other way. Uh, there mm-hmm. were a lot of other countries of interest, of course. Mm-hmm. And so what he hoped for maybe was that this would just be forgotten. Uh, mm. But of course, it doesn't. 
And, and this is, of course, what brings him into trouble. Uh, eventually, uh, there are other young men who are more than willing to fulfill the, the, the project of getting Iceland under their kingdom. And uh, one of these young men is uh, his own, uh, his, his own uh, son-in-law. Mm. And uh, uh, this son-in-law is actually the person that uh, eventually uh, kills Snorri on, uh, by order of the king. In yeah, uh, or, or his posse, or you know, or the the, the mob that stormed Reykjavik at the time, right? Yes, Willis was uh, his former son-in-law, who was in charge of the group. Yeah. And there were actually uh, one or two more son -in former son-in-laws. He was okay. quite <laughs> unfortunate with, with the family members. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they obviously had a grudge too. Uh, yeah, it was the stepson as well. Where he, his second wife had died just three months earlier and he was a little you know, late in, in paying them their inheritance from their mothers. He was very wealthy uh, and they were not very happy with that. They wanted the, their inheritance right away, of course. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so they were also one of, uh, also uh, a member of members of this group. So there were a lot of people who were pissed with him at that time. He was not very mm -hmm. popular in Iceland, mm -hmm. in the last last days of his life, unfortunately. Unfortunately, yeah. uh, there's a famous saying that he says when he's uh, struck down: "Eigi skal hökva. Yeah, you shall not strike. Yeah. You now that uh, people sometimes use that when. Uh, yeah, when they're down under, that you should, <laughs> that you should. Yeah, uh, yeah. Spare, spare course, me, kind of. Yeah, yeah, but of course we don't know if it's uh, exactly that that what he said because uh, asking someone in the medieval times to spare your life is not very courageous. Yes, uh, yeah. you would be a, you would be a coward, and and uh, this is of course uh, the story is told by Snorri's uh, uh, nephew which uh, was named Sturla, son of Thorður, which was not his oldest brother. And Sturla, uh, when he is writing this, he is on the payroll of King Haakon in Norway. He's been in Norway, he was writing his biography. And when you are, are on the payroll, you have to be careful on what you write. Snorri, of course, being uh, killed in disgrace of the king, uh, is not very popular. So he probably is uh, a hum writing in a humiliating way about his uncle. Mm. Uh, so uh, picturizing him as a coward, mm. which is, is, is very, very, a very bad thing. Mm. And uh, it's not, actually here in Rekord, we're not sure that this is exactly that's not what's not said, that he was asking him to spare his life. Maybe he just, his last words were, thou shall not kill, which is the same thing, but it's, total different yeah, you yeah. are dying as a good catholic um ready to meet your maker uh, but thus you're not killed but you're not asking for mercy and so that makes the whole difference yeah yeah i can yeah. understand that that's a good yeah good <laughs> theory or you know yeah. good idea about that but uh so snorri why do you think he was so um uh, you know industrious while writing it, it it's a it's an expensive thing to write at the time you needed a, mm -hmm. a whole calfskin for one page of of these mm -hmm. old sagas icelandic sagas yeah. so uh, yeah. so and they, some of these sagas are quite a quite quite a couple of calfskins so you, you yeah. needed a lot of money and spend a lot of money to do these kind of things yeah. so why why do you think he you know did this why did the uh, he, he he's of course the most influential person to to register all the most of the stories about the Norse mythology, the the gods. Mm -hmm. So what what uh, you know, being a Christian, like you said, why mm -hmm. was he so uh, uh, looking looking after the old gods and talking about them? You know, even though he obviously changed, uh, you know, this was sort of oral tradition, and sometimes he looked at these stories through Christian eyes. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, what what do you, what, what do you think? Why why did he write? When he's writing, because that is his passion, and that's that's the way that he's brought up. He is uh, he has a foster father, which is one of the most uh, wealthiest men of Iceland. Um, this foster father is a grandson of a Norwegian king, so it's not it's simply he's brought up uh, being interested in in his uh, foster father's family and uh, this inheritance. So that and and he's also brought up in Otti, which is the home of Simon Dur the Wise. Simon Turfrode in Iceland, uh, which was uh, uh, so. This is this has always been a place of of scholars and education. 
he has a, a whole library there. And uh, of course, Simon, there's old books and probably a, a lot of books about kings and, and uh, history. So this simply becomes his passion. But you're absolutely right. It, it's very, very expensive to be a writer. And normally, uh, the church and monasteries were the places of writing. But it's not a, he's not dependent on the church or a monastery. He's totally independent in his writing. And mm -hmm. uh, his wealth, actually, he got from women. So I think that's a pretty important thing to, to tell because uh, there, there is always a woman behind every great man in this world. Am I right? You're right. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he actually marries for money. Uh, his first wife is uh, the richest heir of Iceland, uh, the only heir, heir, heir of her father. And when she dies, he uh, remarries. And his uh, wife, number two, is the most wealthiest widow of Iceland. Uh, and he is a clever businessman. He knows... Yeah, he, what he, he, cho he chose the woman wisely. He chose the woman wisely. And uh, as being, a, you know, a, of course, a, a good businessman, he multiplies his fortune. So he, he, he was extremely wealthy. Nothing was uh, spared here in Rekolt, uh, housing or anything. And he was able to write and use his time for, for scholarship and writing. And he had a whole institute here in Rekolt, men who were you know, hired uh, as writers, priest-educated men. Um, we believe that he had around six or seven of them working here, writing day and night, nearly, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and of course, people working on the person, the skin uh, and uh, all that. And you mentioned uh, um, how, how much skin that you had to have for writing just one book. Um, mm -hmm. When he was writing Heimskringla, the book of, of the sagas of the kings, he had to use two skins from 200 calves. So two, that's a lot. Calves. <laughs> 200 calves. Uh, so that is pretty expensive. But that was also, uh, wasn't that also he got some sponsorship by the king for that? Or was that? So, no, okay, no. Did that no. play a part? No, I've never heard that. No, it was, it was pretty much his own money. Uh, and uh, well, some say that uh, wealth for, was accumulated here in the west of Iceland because most of the sagas are written here in this area. And that was maybe because of the, the trade with Greenland. There was some very ex expensive trading between Iceland and Greenland. We mm. would import valuable goods from Greenland, which was colonized from Iceland. And this would involve uh, uh, ivory tusk, which was mm. used for, for valuable things in Europe. And, uh, well, ice bear skin and white falcons and uh, other things like that, which were, was mm. uh, very, very valuable. He would, mm. of course, also export uh, clothing. Um, you know, wool, wool, mm -hmm. uh, woven wool, and uh, on, and fat, melted fat, which was used for for lamps, for lightning in the me me medieval Europe, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. fish, of course, dried fish. The Catholic mm -hmm. Europe uh, required a lot of dried fish. Yeah, and for the fast, fasting yeah. periods. Yeah, and Iceland was a great provider of that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, the story about his upbringing—that's uh, a you know—it's a little bit of a one of the things that happened when uh, there were disputes. Sometimes that then uh, then people, uh, influential people or powerful people, would uh, maybe uh, you know, say, "I will adopt your son and and uh, <laughs> bring him up to uh, be a good and wise man and a wealthy man uh, if we settle this matter." So Snorri was an example of that, right? Uh, he was son of the chieftain, and then. Then he was uh, kind of adopted like an exchange for peace or, or settlement. Yes, it, yeah, it was actually very, quite common that uh, our families would uh, foster each other's children. Uh, this would be similar as you would, uh, you know, tighten bonds between families by marriage. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, it was either marriage or or fostering uh, children, uh, you would be, uh, the, you know, tighten very strict bond between the families, and so you would you would never attack a family with bonds mm -hmm. like that. And mm -hmm. uh, if the other family, one of the other, other families would be attacked, then you would, of course, help and stand by their side. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, of course, is very important because this is what makes his destiny. And uh, what happens is that uh, when Snorri is only three years old, 
his father is involved in a conflict with the priest that lived here in Rekolt. And of course, as in most uh, conflicts, it was about money and inheritance. Um, to solve the conflict, uh, uh, this was really escalating. They had to call the law speaker of Iceland. And the law speaker at that time was Jon Loftsson of Otti in uh, south of Iceland, which was the grandson of a Norwegian king. Hmm. Uh, actually, the Magnus the Berlect. You heard about him, the last Viking king. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Magnus said, thou shall have, ah, it's been too long with American tourists, thou shall have, uh, uh, it will come back to me. Yeah, okay. no problem, no problem. <laughs> I, I was trying to help you, but my, my mind just blanks, sorry. But Yeah, okay. <laughs> but... Uh, but uh, Jon Lofsson, uh, he is uh, called in as the law speaker to solve the, the conflict, and which he does. And uh, um, as trying to make uh, Snorri's father happy with uh, what he got out of it, uh, he offers to foster his little son Snorri. Uh, so when Snorri is uh, somewhere between three and four years old, he's uh, sent from the west of Iceland in Kvammur and to Otte, which this is maybe 500 kilometers or so, Mm -hmm. uh, and to his foster father, which is in his 60s at that time, and mm -hmm. where he's brought up. And uh, um, this must have been very, very hard for a little boy. You know, he's he's taken away from his uh, from his mother and mm -hmm. um, from from his from his fa whole family, uh, sent to total totally different people. Uh, there's no mother figure to take care of him. There's just, uh, you know, middle-aged men. Hmm. Uh, really, the, the son of Jón, which is named Simon, he becomes more of the foster uh, father than, than Jón is because he has long before brought up his own children. He's not, I think, very interested in small children at that time. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is something that um, um, influenced him. Uh, or mm -hmm. had great effect on him later in life because he he has difficulties in um, bonding with his own children, and uh, uh, I'm sure that today he would have had a, some kind of a diagnosis. Uh, I think that he had problems, you know, with his feelings and bonding with yeah, with people. Not that he would have been a bad man, but uh, but problems in in with bonding. Uh, they would they would call the social services on him. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but what? So, what are you doing in Reykjavik now? So, this is a, a museum about Snorri, right? Yeah. And um, this is also for scholars, so they can uh, study the sagas, right? Or or just study what they just study. Uh, of course, uh, we we want. Most of the scholars to to be uh, doing some scholarship in the medieval times. Mm -hmm. uh, we prefer that, of course, uh, but we we have all kinds of all kinds of scholars staying here. They can be translators, uh, and um, yeah, well, basically all kinds of scholars. They just have to send an application. Mm -hmm. uh, we have. Uh, I'm not uh, sure I understand. <laughs> <laughs> It's your it's your Siri or something like that. Oh my god! Oh my god! It's my yeah! Oh my god! Yeah. No <laughs> so okay. It's my uh, eye watch. Yeah. Yeah, your eye watch. My eye watch. <laughs> you're losing you're, you're losing control of your uh, gadgets. Yes. Yes. Uh, so uh, and then there's also the church there. Um, regular yeah. sermons or what? Or or is it? Yes. The, yes. Know? Well, on the picture you can see, of course, the church on the right with a cross in front of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the tower in between and the guest reception is under the tower and mm -hmm. the exhibition is in the basement under the church. Mm -hmm. And in the left side, we have uh, Snorra Stova, which is a, a medieval uh, research institution. And we have been uh, uh, project leading several uh, projects uh, on, uh, uh, well, both excavations and, uh, yeah, and different other projects, but they all are, are connected to, uh, to the medieval times in some way. And we've mm -hmm. actually uh, published around 24 books since we were officially uh, began, um, Snorrestor was officially established, which was in the year 2000. 24 books? So yes. about the sagas and Snorri? Yes, yes, medieval 
the medieval times and uh, um, and sagas, uh, manuscripts. Yeah. Nice. Uh, the also, uh, also of course, uh, the Norse mythology. Um, I think we have uh, yeah, six books, which is uh, um, uh, ten year projects about the Norse mythology. So uh, that's yeah, that's uh, around six books. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. Do you have a, a, like a, a online shop, but people can? No, no, no online shop. No. Can can people no. connect uh, contact you via email or something like that? We are you know yeah, to yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Yes, of course they can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, oh. we have some different things that, of course, we we sell here, which you can't purchase uh, in any other places. Uh, of course, we have all the books that we publish ourselves. I was mentioning, but we also have uh, silver necklaces, which uh, are formed as uh, the pool that you're uh, watching there on 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 the screen. Mm -hmm. It's not as pool. Uh, we have that in two different uh, um, two different uh, um, yeah. Versions. Uh, and versions, and we also have uh, a copy of uh, a ring. So it's a, a silver ring, gold, golden plated, which is um, a replica of a ring that was excavated here, and is a 13th century ring. Okay, cool. Very beautiful. Is that, is, is, yeah. is that made by uh, some, uh, you know, work uh, like people uh, working in the area, or is it is it handcrafted, or is it you know, or or just designed by you, or how? It's designed, it's designed by us. But okay. but the ring, for example, is a copy. Uh, the original yeah. is kept at the National Museum, and we had a goldsmith to who took a copy and uh, produced it for us. A same uh, a wine glass that also was excavated here. We also have a copy of uh, a similar glass, which is also sold here. Okay. And and with with uh, the remains of this glass was found in the building that we believe was not his private residence. Mm -hmm. But this is uh, this is a pretty uh, you know famous pond here or pool. Pool, uh, yeah. One of the, you know, yeah, a hot, hot tub. tub. You know, yeah. we, we we Icelanders sure loved our hot tub because you can see it like here. This is this is from the early twelfth century where where yes. Snorri makes a hot tub here in the in the garden. So he's. He has a hot tub. Did he have a? Did he have some kind of a sauna, or, or was there was there something in that? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. But there was a, a, a building on the on the farm site that uh, has uh, double floors, and mm -hmm. he was actually leading steam through uh, a conduct of stone from his private hot spring, which he had yeah. on the site. Yeah. So he was leading steam uh, through these two floors. And there are different theories of what uh, this uh, room or this building was used as. Uh, some believe it was a, a bathhouse or a sauna. Others believe it was a brewery, even. Yeah, and, of course, uh, of course, it was a brewery. I I, I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe. Uh, well, I've been told by the chief archaeologist that uh, she believes it was a brewery because there were no traditions of uh, of saunas in Iceland. Mm -hmm. um, she also discovered some insects on this stone floor with dead insects, of course, uh, which were foreign. And she believes that they came here with imported grain. So mm. she believes that they were. Uh, this was used for the brewing. So that's why yeah. she, she is quite convinced that this was a brewery. Yeah. yeah. It, it, uh, so just to tell the uh, uh, people watching us, uh, we are. There are just uh, there's not a lot of grain growing in Iceland for brewing. Uh, it was at the time, you know, they were trying about barley and stuff like that. But there was a mini ice age here that arrived in the 13th, 14th century that cooled everything up. So, so we had needed to import everything. But Snorri obviously had the means to to you know import the barley and grains needed for for making beer for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is not open for public, right? The hot tub? No, this is no, just, no. This is just it for Joe, right, today? Yes, it's preserved and you're not allowed to bathe in it. But uh, in Snorri's time, it, it was around 40 degrees and it could easily be that as well today. But actually, for for cheating the tourists, we cool it because no, we can't no. guard it. <laughs> so, we don't so, they, so, they don't, so, so they don't go <laughs> sneaking into it in the night. They you, you just <laughs> well, some, Yeah, some people do. So yeah. uh, so we just cool it. So it's just around my, maybe 20, 25 degrees. So that's not very nice in a cold Icelandic day. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if they go in, they go up again very, very fast. Very soon, very soon, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> so um, um, I'm, just, uh, I'm just curious that, uh, you know, Snorri, obviously, uh, you're talking about the Eyjasaga. What, what, why do you think uh, 
uh, you, his fingerprints are on that uh, story or saga. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, there's so many sim similarities uh, in Eil saga and the King sagas, Hemskringla. And mm -hmm. nobody argues today that's not that he wrote uh, the King sagas. And uh, uh, well, Eil, he travels to Norway. And uh, uh, it, it's obvious that the person who writes Eil saga is, uh, he, he knows very well about. Um, you know, traveling on the west coast of Norway. He's mm -hmm. quite familiar with everything. And there are many similarities with Heimskringla and also the, the style of the writing. Um, what has been done actually recently is that um, the Icelandic, some of the Icelandic sagas, they have been they're put um, through computer programs where they count the words and uh, how, how the writing style is. It's done in some, some kind of matter, I don't know, but they have these programs who analyze it. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it was um, it, it was very very likely that this was the same person, you know, just comparing the writing styles mm -hmm. and which word you would uh, use that it was the same writer that wrote Eil Saga and Hemskringla. Mm -hmm. Okay, I I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is actually that all the Icelandic sagas, uh, well, the Icelandic sagas that we have today, they're not originals. They are. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they are reproductions and reproductions of reproductions, rewritings. Mm -hmm. And every time a, a saga would be rewritten, the writer would uh, change it a little bit and add something from his own heart. Mm -hmm. And that's, for example, why um, Grette saga, which we were talking about previously, has um, the ghost and some, some things that are maybe, you know, fantasy because it's mm -hmm. been rewritten so many times. But the, yeah, the so first so later, so later writers started to add their own yes. things into them. Okay, yes, interesting. Yes. And their own fantasy and what, what they what they felt that would make the, the story more interesting for the, the readers and spice it up a little bit and what was in fashion also from, from abroad, inspirations mm -hmm. from abroad. But mm -hmm. it's um, it's it's uh, certain that uh Sturla Thorosson's not his cousin, which I mentioned before that he is, is very, very likely the writer of Grette Saga mm -hmm. and that the Grette Saga is uh, or was quite different in, in the first original. But one thing I want to tell you about Grette Saga, because here in the countryside in Iceland and here in Reykjavik, um, the sagas and well, the history is very, very close to us also in our you know, in our daily life and to us as, uh, as you know, people living here. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, yeah, um, so, sorry, real quick, <laughs> how many are living in Rekos right today? Uh, uh, Rekos and Krokos? 47, yeah, 47 people who are our mm -hmm. residents here. It's mm -hmm. not the village, it's just some houses. Most most of the people, they are connected to the institute or to the hotel which is here. Mm -hmm. or, or they are, are retired people, uh, retired uh, artists, retired uh, writer, mm -hmm. a doctor, and, and people like that. It's, yeah. it's a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice here. Yeah. But um, um, just to tell you a small story about how, how close to us um, this is and how real this is to us, is that uh, the reverend here, who was a reverend here for 42 years, he had heard uh, stories about a small cave uh, up um, in the in the lava field uh, just under the glacier of Erikur. and uh, um, this lava uh, lava well, the, this cave had been discovered in uh, 1926 and it and some people had entered it and they had discovered a skeleton very very old one probably nearly 1000 years old and mm -hmm. the the skull had been, you know, hit by an axe. It was very obvi obvious. Really? And they took uh, um, the remains of this person, put it, put him in uh, a box and uh, took him home to Rekolt, where he was buried in a grave. But they took a couple of uh, bones from the skeleton and, uh, and sent it to Reykjavik, to the National Museum, so they could uh, investigate and, and uh, you know, find precisely how, how old it was. Mm -hmm. um, what later happened is that uh, everybody forgot where the grave was, just knew that it had, was there, but no, nobody remembered where it was. Mm -hmm. And the National Museum, they had uh, 
they didn't didn't know what know what they did with the remains of the bones. It was just it had vanished. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, the reverend he wanted to try to find the cave again, and to see if there were some remains in the cave. So some bones that had been left behind or something. Mm -hmm. And he was actually successful. And he came home with, uh, uh, well, a garbage uh, bag filled with some remains of the bone. And they were sent to Reykjavik. And he is convinced that this person that was lying there in the cave is a person that is mentioned in the saga of Grettir. Grettir was uh, working uh, for... Uh, some farmers in uh, Kalmanstunga, which is uh, a big farm just under the glacier. Mm -hmm. And he was helping them collecting the sheep there. And he came into an argument with a worker from the farm because of some food. And he killed him with an axe. Of course. In like <laughs> Yes, directly in the head with an axe. And and he took the body and put him in, it was described, you know, in the, in the saga, and put the body in a small cave. And then when, when everybody were asking, you know, where is this guy? And so on, he said, no, I didn't know. So he never told anybody. Yeah. But but the reverend and, of course, the rest of us, we are very much convinced that, that this uh, old skeleton was the, the old worker. The poor old worker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people, some people say that uh, we would have a higher murder count in Iceland uh, if the bodies in the, all the lava fields would be discovered. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> but that's another story. But okay, so uh, uh, yeah, that's interesting. You know, uh, did they date? Did, did they manage to date the uh, body after they found the. Uh, well, oh, no, you, you yeah. know, uh, Paul Bergthorsson, which is um, an, yeah. Uh, yeah, mytho <laughs> mythologist in Iceland, he's uh, 96 or so. I think he turns 97 next summer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Know, <laughs> that's an amazing man. Yeah. He's actually from a farm there uh, in this area, and uh, he was with Gate when they went to the lava field. So th these two, one 70 years old, the other one 94, and the young man was around 30, and he, he was, of course, the one who had to go into the cave. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Pat, which is, a, 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 you might say, an amateur archeolo archaeologist, Mm -hmm. uh, he was. He's very, very much convinced that this this uh, skeleton is around nine nine hundred or something years old, and, and mm -hmm. uh, but it hasn't been dated yet, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, the reverend has to pay for that for it himself, and it's actually what? quite expensive. Yeah, so you have to pay the National Museum for making the date. For the, for the investigations, yeah. So it, it's just lying there, and I hope they don't lose it again. But I <laughs> yeah. actually saw, I actually saw the all, all the all the, the remains. Um, I was in. It was um, just the day after they had been there. I was invited for for dinner at the vicarage, and um, uh, and um, um, after we had uh, had dinner, we were having some. Uh, mm. Uh, red wine and uh, some cheese and uh, then he just came with uh, a black garbage bag and it was all put on a silver tray so we had it between the, the wine and the cheese and some old bones from the ninth century Looking nothing wrong with that there's nothing, nothing wrong, wrong with that, with that. no <laughs> nothing wrong with that um, completely it's, normal <laughs> it's actually quite funny because i had my son with with me because i wanted to be able to have a drink with the reverend, that's it, 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 you always have a very nice time, you know, having so a drink with the reverend. He mm -hmm. knows it's a very uh, cunning man. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had my son with with me. He's, he's thirty years old, and um, he was just moving to Iceland from Denmark. Mm -hmm. He's uh, was born and raised in Denmark because I, we lived in Denmark for thirty years, me and my husband. So he was moving to Iceland at that time from Denmark, and this was, uh, I think, his second day in Iceland. And then he just sat there, you know, in a vicarage with some <laughs> 900 years bones. And uh, he, he just felt that he was, you know, in some other planet. It was yeah, very yeah. unreal. <laughs> yeah. Is this the Icelandic style of... So this, is, this is Iceland. <laughs> yeah, this is Iceland. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's been great talking to you, Sigrun. I know that you have sometimes concerts also in the in the church, right? Or, yes. Or is it yeah. in church or... Yes, the church is uh, has very very good acoustic, uh, so it's frequently used as a concert house. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, tomorrow evening we're having the first concert of the season, 
we've been having nothing for a, nearly a whole year because of the COVID. Uh, but uh, tomorrow evening we're having a, a concert with, with Ellen Kristjansdóttir. Oh, uh, nice. uh, yeah, Martin Singer. She was very famous in the 80s, 90s. Yeah, yeah, she is. She is. She's still famous. She's, she's, she's still going famous. strong. Yeah, yeah. She uh, has a lovely. She, she has a lovely voice. So uh, has, I, I'm, yeah. I'm going to link a Spotify to her Spotify account here later on the, in the comments. Yeah, here. yeah, you do that. Yeah, and she's with her husband Aethor, which is uh, he's of course quite famous. He was with Mesoforte. Yeah, the garden great, party and um, great, yeah, great piano player. Oh, well, sounds yeah. good. Good. I wish I wish I could attend. Yeah, so I really look forward to that. So that's uh, tomorrow evening. And then, of course, every summer on the last weekend of July, we have the Record Festival, which is the classical concert festival um, for a whole weekend, starts on a Friday and ends on a Sunday. Okay. And people, they come here all, all around, uh, you know, from Reykjavik and, and everywhere. And uh, they uh, many of them stay the whole weekend. So it's, it's very, very nice and we're always fully booked and the church takes nearly 300 people and seat it. So it's a, it's a great, great time. Look forward for that. Is and there, is there yeah. like a tent site area close to Rico's no, door? No, no, not a tent site. No. Of course, there, there's of course uh, the hotel there close by yes. Foss Hotel and, and more. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and also a lot of private guest houses in the area. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the, the beautiful Husafet Hotel. Yeah, of course. Yeah, which is uh, a luxury luxury hotel. And so they have a camping site also, and yeah. um, it's a small village just uh, six kilometers from Reykjavik, where there's also a campsite, which mm -hmm. is also very nice. So Klepjus Reykir, but staying at the hotel here, you know, really, you know, having a luxury weekend is, uh, yeah, just just a dream. Yeah. yeah, Krema natural baths, so of course, yeah, are close absolutely. by also. Yeah, this is a, this is a very uh, so for you guys that are watching, uh, this uh, you know, there are so many things to check out there. You can check out Husafet, you go, you can mm -hmm. go into the glacier, you can check out Snorrastova, Krema natural bath. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a nice swimming pool there, uh, cave, Vidkenner, one of the biggest lava caves in the world, exactly, and yeah, yeah and. Mm -hmm. Batna Fossar, Hrin Fossar, the waterfalls, beautiful. So yeah. um, a lot of things to to see and, and experience there uh, for you. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, so I have to pick up my boys. It's about, <laughs> it's about kindergarten closing time. So um, yeah, you have kindergarten children. <laughs> yes, I, yeah, I know. I'm pretty late at, at doing these things. but <laughs> Yeah, I just have grandchildren now. Yeah. A lot of them. Fortunately, my, my children are, uh, they they have more children than I had. So, oh, so you so you can spoil them and just return yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely. So they they come frequently and visit. So and I tell them about uh, Snorri and uh, well, they they were four and five years old, the two oldest. Okay. They they, they feel it's very very exciting for, to hear stories about the guy who was killed here, uh, yeah, yeah. in the tunnel by the, the by the hot pot and yeah. Yeah, I was, yeah. I, was, I, was I was actually looking forward to uh, uh, you know go, coming to the site and walk around and see things. But so yeah. uh, it's not it was killed here in the yes. uh, here in the, in the tunnel that, that leads the up tunnel. to the bath. So, yeah. so so there's there's a, like a tunnel that leads to the house from from the house of Snorri to the hot tub. So he was yeah. very industrious, very luxurious. Obviously, he, <laughs> had, he didn't want to walk outside in the cold. He, he <laughs> so uh, yeah, he was killed there in the in, unfortunately yeah. in the tunnel. Yeah, yeah. So, but unfortunately, uh, yeah, we couldn't make it last week. But I'm definitely gonna try again this this uh, this summer, hopefully. Yes, please. Happy to receive you. Tak, tak. So and bless all the American guests, of course, and everybody. <laughs> yeah, oh, hope, hope you join us. Uh, I'm just gonna give a shout out to Mimi and Shannon and Linda and Jenny and Carolyn, Dorinda, Christine, Laisha, Monica and Stephen and so forth. So uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, I know more people are gonna watch later on but uh, talk finish bless yes bye bye <laughs>